Has generative AI already jumped the shark? Let's talk about it. Welcome to AI Insights and Innovation, your go-to podcast for the latest news, trends, and insights in artificial intelligence, including generative AI. I'm your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, B-List Geek, longtime AI systems architect and analyst at The Cube Research. Let's get into the topic. Hey, Siri. Hmm? What is meant by the term to jump the shark? The idiom jump the shark is used to describe a moment when something that was once great has reached a point where it will now decline in quality. This is from IMDb. So obviously that's a bit clickbaity, but uh, it's interesting. Actually, jump the shark came from uh, Happy Days uh, way back when Fonzie, uh, when the, 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 the idea started to run out of steam or the show started to run out of the steam, um, uh, they had a uh, episode where he jumped a uh, uh, jumped a shark on uh, with water skis, and I thought that was kind of appropriate. But it's often referred to as things that have kind of reached a pinnacle. Uh, and in other words, it's, it's not a lot further we can go with it. We're kind of trying to figure out you know what it is and what we can use it for uh, for additional insights. And I think that's where we are uh, in many respects within generative AI, even though it's only been around a couple of years. So let's figure that out. So in this episode, we're going to get into whether generative AI, despite its impressive innovation, has already reached its peak. Uh, we investigate the challenges organizations face in identifying practical use cases and justifying the substantial costs associated with their deployment. And what we're getting into, and by the way, this is not asserting that generative AI is going to go away. Um, what I'm asserting is that we've kind of reached a point where there's other options that are cheaper. Uh, there's other options that are more lightweight. There's other options that, that can be more tactically applied that may be better options for many businesses. And so as a surge of adoption, you know, has occurred and nothing I've seen in my career, and I'm 62 years old, I've been in this business since I was 18, has really matched what we've seen in the rise of AI, the re-rise of AI around the, gen, uh, the, uh, the generative AI stuff, obviously with the rise of ChatGPT. Uh, people could see the value in it. Uh, people used it in their daily lives to do very handy things like write notes, write emails, uh, uh, become a, a workflow automation system. Um, uh, operate cars, operate devices, th the list goes on. And so obviously AI has always had uh, a lot of value that it's able to bring to applications to the business. And generative AI is just able to do that a bit better because it's able to generate um, new uses of the information. Now, generative AI systems are normally defined by LLMs, large language models, and those are huge models that are created with massive amounts of information, and that's why they become handy. The reason we use ChatGPT uh, and other LLMs is because they've been trained with a lot of the, the information on the internet, and so therefore they're able to map patterns within that information to provide us with responses that we can uh, access through natural language processing. processing. We can talk to it. We can ask it about the weather. We can ask it about a particular topic. We can ask, as I just did with, um, with the Siri application, uh, about a particular term. And it's able to find a path through the information and bring us the appropriate data to us. What comes into play here is that generative AI has a tendency to be very heavyweight systems, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And so in other words, it takes a huge amount of data to train these systems, a huge amount of processing, and a huge amount of money that needs to be leveraged to make this processing occur. So as businesses are looking at the applications or the use cases for generative AI, uh, they're often uh, a little confused about what they can use it for for their particular business, and also often confused about the expense of building these systems. And so that's kind of where we're at right now. We understand the power of it, we understand the value of it. It's getting better as time goes on, all the new releases of the LLMs out there. But businesses, CIOs, CEOs, boards of directors are looking around trying to figure out if this is actually something that's going to provide business value for them. In fact, you know, many articles, and I'll link them down in the uh, in the comments, um, or sorry, in, in below, were you know depict the fact that CIOs are you know running into trouble in finding use cases uh, for generative AI. 
And so here we are. We have access to this very innovative technology uh, that uh, came uh, through the evolution of AI. Generative AI is a subset or a, a derivative of machine learning, and machine learning is a derivative of AI. And of course, we have deep learning and other systems there. So we're at a place where we're asking the appropriate questions in terms of what can we do with it? And I think businesses are trying to figure that out right now. And that's the core of the discussion here. So why are we asking this question now about uh, generative AI kind of hitting its pinnacle? Um, because I think people are getting a bit sick of the generative AI hype. Uh, every cloud computing show out there now is a generative AI show. And virtually every enterprise software player uh, is going to have and promote uh, their technology through the lens of generative AI. Even when I went to RSA a couple of months ago, um, even though it's a security conference, everybody was, in essence, talking about generative AI, protecting generative AI, leveraging generative AI within their tools and technologies. And it was just so hype-driven that all of the vendors feel they need to align their technology strategies behind it. And that kind of continues to this day. But I think as the rank and file out there, CIOs, people who are you know, in, responsible for automating core business systems, um, they're seeing a lot of hype out there. They're seeing a lot of interest in it, certainly even from uh, their staff members, their employees. Um, but they're not necessarily seeing very obvious use cases for it. And they also see when they look at the cost of the thing, uh, the fact of the matter is that they just don't have enough budget to deploy some of these huge honking generative AI systems based on large language models for their particular business case. Now, they can use LLMs, and certainly, you know, there's tactical uses for LLMs such as supply chain integration, uh, logistics management, inventory management, things like that. But as far as them building a generative AI system, that's a bit of a tougher putt uh, for the rank and file CIOs out there, CEOs, the people who are actually running the companies. So the overload continues, and people are telling me all the time <laughs> that they're, they're just saturated with their generative AI hype. But, you know, some people, uh, you know, I get on briefings, and, and the first thing they say, well, we don't want to talk about generative AI. They just get too much of it. And so social media platforms and content websites are becoming in, you know, inundated with uh, AI-generated articles, posts, videos, things like that. The amount of AI-driven stuff out there, people, you know, performing avatars and deep fakes and uh, even, you know, leveraging AI podcasts that are generated from their voice or even AI uh, YouTube uh, videos, and there's a ton of them out there, um, is just enormous. And so people feel that this technology is getting overused uh, and probably misused in many instances, and they're just getting a bit saturated with it. So... There's also inaccurate or misleading information, AI-generated news articles or summaries that contain factual errors or lack of context. Uh, as I mentioned with generative AI systems, normally they go a mile wide and an inch deep. And the reason is, is because they only have information that they've been trained to provide. And if the information's not there, they're not going to give you any additional information or insights into it. So there's no innovative differentiator. There's no kind of common thinking in terms of what a particular topic means and how it's defined, but what it means to you and some deeper insights into what we're considering, some innovation, innovative thinking around using the information. And so if we're leveraging AI to generate all these articles and generate all these videos, we're not getting that perspective. It's also high cost with minimum ROI. Uh, and we already mentioned that companies investing heavily in AI driven customer service bots, you know, to find that customers prefer speaking with human representatives due to the bot's inability to handle complex queries or offer emp empathetic responses. As a result, they return minimal amount of investment. So we're seeing lots of organizations that are investing in chatbots as a means of providing customer service. And sometimes that's not bad. I talk to a lot of generative AI chatbots that can help me uh, solve issues and technical problems and things like that. But there's lots of very bad ones out there uh, that may provide you with erroneous information. They may lead you down the wrong path. And they're certainly not going to be humans. They're not going to be empathetic around, uh, around what you do. And if they try to make them empathetic, at least where the technology is now, they, they sound kind of condescending. And so people are kind of pushing back on that. 
Also, you got the job displacement fears. Everybody's afraid that generative AI is going to take over their jobs. And in some instances, that's going to be the case. So designers writing music comp uh, uh, compositions, increasingly concerned about AI encroaching on job security. Um, and of course, we're talking about their ethical point of view, what it's able to do and what it's not able to do. And even though we have seen some displacement uh, with automating information worker kind of things, it hasn't been to the degree I think that everybody thought it would be. And here we are at the end, you know, approaching the end of 2024. Overpromised capabilities, uh, AI powered personal assistants, the claim to revolutionize the productivity. But, you know, they ultimately failed to understand the nuances of the commands or integrate effectively with other tools. Uh, and it becomes kind of an integration nightmare if people are going to use these things across systems, at least now. Now, we have some promising technology like Apple Intelligence that's coming forward, which is going to provide us with an AI agent uh, that's going to be on our phone. So the jury's still out on that. And I think we're going to perfect this as time goes on. But right now, the technology is not at a place where people feel uh, that it's not with, without its downsides. And of course, privacy and e uh, ethical concerns. Um, generative AI systems can do really cool stuff like uh, backward engineer uh, uh, anonymized information and actually add, add uh, um, identities to it. Uh, that's not so good. That violates HIPAA regulations, privacy issues. Corporate bandwagoning, example, you know, businesses, everybody's jumped on the generative AI bandwagon. They did so from the beginning. Uh, if they don't have some sort of a generative AI strategy or AI strategy, they don't feel that they're players in their particular industries that they're in. Uh, so everybody, as I mentioned, all cloud conferences are now generative AI conferences. You know, every technology system out there is going to have a strategy around how they're going to leverage, how they're going to protect, how generative AI kind of fits into the, uh, you know, into their ecosystem. So the novelty is wearing off. You know, early adopters have generated, you know, AI generated art and music. Initially, found the technology fascinating, I mean, cool. You know, but over time, the novelty wears off. Creation, lack of emotion, depth, and creativity in human artistry uh, becomes missing from a lot of those things. Uh, and so uh, the number of AI, AI uh, written drawings out there, and some of them are pretty cool, is just overwhelming. And so if you're creating art, uh, there has to be some sort of an innovative differentiator that's going to set your art aside. Complexity and integration. Examples, enterprises attempting to integrate generative AI tools and other into their operations also face often face significant challenges related to data management system compatibility, workforce training, uh, and it leads to frustration in stalled projects. Uh, I'm a generative AI architect. I'm an AI architect uh, who used to be a cloud architect and who used to be an IT architect, and I've done those jobs as well. It's not a simple thing to make these things work and play well together, and certainly with generative AI, again, you've got to find a valid use case for it, and sometimes that may not be available. Um, so people who are looking to build a generative AI system in many instances I'll come and meet with them. I'll look at them. You know, traditional technology will do a better job at building the same system, and it's about one fifth the cost. So there's no business justification for using a generative AI stuff uh, and to build. And the reason it's so expensive is because of the complexity, the cost of the talent. Uh, AI architects, you know, make a lot of money, uh, and AI engineers make a lot of money. Data scientists make a lot of money. And so if you're going to invest in this area, get the talent you need, invest in the technology, invest in the processing power that you need, you know, massive amounts of GPUs, for example, it's going to be very expensive. And there's a bit of sticker shock going on out there right now. And also customer experience declines. You know, e-commerce websites using AI for personalized recommendation that continuously miss the mark, leading to subpar shopping experience and customer dissatisfaction. We've had lots of issues. I'm not going to name the, the fast food chain, but they were using AI uh, at, at their kiosks to take orders from customers. Customers got frustrated with it, uh, and then they pulled it back. And so we're seeing those sorts of uh, uh, fallbacks to more traditional ways of doing something uh, from early adopters of generative AI. And by the way, th that does not mean that it's not going to improve uh, the ability to build these kiosk systems, these intelligent systems. What I'm asserting is that is we're moving too fast in many instances in leveraging generative AI, and have used them for use cases where they have no uh, they have no real chance of solving the issues. And so, 
we're trying to get smarter with the technology, but right now I just see the misapplication of generative AI more so than the than the correct application of generative AI for the business use cases out there. So what's the future of this? Generative AI is not going away, and I'm not making the assertion that it is. I'm not saying we're all sick of it, you know, and therefore everybody's going to get off the technology and it's going to die a quick death. I think we're normalizing the use of it and becoming a bit more familiar with the advantages that it's able to bring and also, you know, some of the downsides of it as well, cost being the downside, overuse uh, of technology, uh, and the ability not to use it uh, in the proper context for the business. Also, the fact that everybody is deploying in deploying generative AI systems are deploying heavyweight AI systems and not necessarily looking at lighter weight technologies like Agentic AI. We talked about that in the uh, in the last podcast, the last video, uh, which is more of a lightweight deployment of AI based systems that can leverage generative AI and the ability to have intelligent agents that interact one to another, maybe uh, a technology that's going to have more use cases for the lightweight tactical use of AI, which I think is where business is going to focus. They're not going to build LLMs. They're going to build very small language models. They're going to build tactical use cases for AI, you know, doing supply chain integration, logistics processing, inventory control, things that really make them money where we're not building these huge systems that take 10 days to train out of massive amounts of information, but they're doing very tactical, very productive things for the business. And utilizing AI when it's going to provide value within the application. And agentic AI may have more of a promise. Um, Dave Valenti just wrote an article about this, you know, talking about his generative AI passe. And and I agree, we're, we're kind of talking about the same thing here. And the reason we're talking about that is because there seems to be lighter weight, more cost-effective ways of leveraging AI, agentic AI being the latest key trend, which is based on an old trend of leveraging AI agents. So those have been around for a long time. I worked on those 20 years ago, um, but is going to be cheaper and therefore deliver more value to the business. And they're a little bit more flexible in being distributed uh, and the ability to be embedded with certain business processes, not necessarily try to take over major systems. And I think businesses are going to be more attracted to that kind of a model um, versus the generative AI model, which is very heavyweight and very procedural based. So we need to have a pragmatic look for this stuff. It has to transform the poten uh, potential in various domains, software development, you know, where it can boost productivity, automating repetitive tasks. I think it has an application there. However, you have to look at the potential, uh, the potential values of that which depends on overcoming challenges and finding, you know, finding uh, sustainability, valuable applications for the stuff. So it's one of these things where we go through it all the time as, a, as an industry. And the technology industry is, does this a lot. In other words, we'll chase a particular shiner, shiny object. You know, 15 years ago, it was cloud computing. Before that, it was service-oriented architecture and integration and distributed systems and the PCs and LANs and client server and all these trends that kind of came along. And we move very quickly after that particular trend, invest a lot of money. Everybody feels left out if they're not talking about and leveraging this technology, but eventually it normalizes around the real value that the technology is able to provide. And I think generative AI is doing that now. So when I say jump the shark, we're reaching kind of a pinnacle on the hype. And I think we're looking around to trying to see, trying to find the real value of this stuff for the business. And business leaders are asking that question and they should be asking that question because in many cases, IT is asking for, you know, five, six times the budget for building these applications and building these generative AI systems when there's no real business advantage in doing so. And that's just going to be a recipe for going out of business. If you're starting building these systems for just the reason of getting the generative AI checkbox uh, on your uh, quarterly reports. So you don't want to be that person. You, want to, you don't want to be that company. So while generative AI is innovative and it's not going away and it's going to be a form of AI uh, pretty much forever, uh, very much like machine learning, it's a, deriv it's a, it's a uh, uh, derivative of machine learning. Uh, other AI-based technologies, agentic AI, uh, and the ability to look at deep learning and all these sorts of disciplines that have spun off of AI. Generative AI is going to have a role. It's going to have something that it's able to do well 
that businesses and industry are going to be able to use the ability to create LLMs around a particular, uh, you know, vertical industry such as healthcare and the ability to do centralized diagnostics versus one hospital owning and maintaining the LLM. But like it's an LLM that may be leveraged by a hundred different hospitals and therefore they're able to use that technology in an economical way and also allows them to scale. So all these sorts of things are being considered now. Uh, I'm in a lot of these meetings. I'm in a lot of briefings, talking to technology providers. They're seeing the same thing. And while it's kind of being whispered around now, I think people don't want to be, uh, I guess, the person like myself who provides the message that uh, this may be something uh, that we have to kind of take a harder look at. Um, those kinds of things are, you know, being back channeled a lot right now. And I, th- I think people are seeing the normalization of the generative AI hype and utilization of different mechanisms, the ability finally to find applications for it, and the ability to figure out how we're going to make this financially viable for the smaller companies out there, and even the Global 2000 companies, and leveraging this technology effectively. We have to figure out how to deal with governance, strategic integration, ongoing innovation. We have to deal with security. All these sorts of things are problems that still need to be solved. So this is not necessarily trying to, uh, this is not me uh, talk, telling you about the swan song that generative AI is playing. Technology never goes away. This is exciting technology. It's going to have some value. I just think it's being oversold right now. And right now, I think businesses are aligning themselves in other directions in some instances. So in other words, they're not all in with generative AI. They're looking at other options, agentic AI, non-AI systems, for example, workflow-based systems, bot, uh, uh, RPA, uh, robotics, proce- robotics process automation, things like that, to provide more tactical uses of AI. And I think that's a smart thing to do. So keep that in mind. Well, that's all I have for you this week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, uh, you know, check out the Cube. Check out the Cube research. Check out some of the work we've done. Uh, check out the uh, great videos uh, that are put out by the Cube. Uh, They spend a lot of time on the analysis of those things. I use them as resources for these videos and for my work as an analyst, my work as an architect. Uh, So good resources there. you have any comments, uh, questions for me, uh, hit me up in the comments below. Else, I'll see you next week. Cheers, guys.